So we are going to start the afternoon, this afternoon session, with something. Um, that is my first talk. There we go. Okay, so the title of this talk is actually uncomplicated type B aortic dissection. Can we predict which patients will benefit from T-bar? And I think you've already seen a picture of King George. And King George is the poor king. He was actually on the potty when he died over here. And here's the, I don't know if you put this quote up or not, Eric, if you had that quote up on your talk I missed the beginning. I had better Yeah. Um, so uh, King George, uh, interestingly, they had uh, journals back in the 1761, so I guess. So again, the epidemiology, we've gone over this, and I, it doesn't hurt to repeat it again. Uh, significant incidents, 10 to 15 cases per 100,000 adults, two-thirds of, of dissections are type A, about a third are type B. Of the type B, about 30% of them are complicated. And of the, and, and, and so that leaves us a significant proportion of uncomplicated type B aortic dissections. <clears throat> There's really been kind of a paradigm shift in terms of the treatment. Classically, type A dissection is treated with open surgery. There is no question that with the technology that we have, and I know that Dr. Youssef's mouth is watering over the concept of a T-bar for type A dissection. A stent. That's coming down the road. They're doing it in Europe. Uh, I believe there may be some trial centers here in the U.S. But, uh, and in Canada. But uh, the TVAR for type A dissection will be coming. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure when it arrives, we'll be doing it. Uh, type B, the uh, complicated, as we talked about earlier, the traditional treatment was surgery. And the surgery was, for lack of a better term, brutal. It, it, it was just brutal. It was almost impossible to do, and the outcomes were atrocious. Mortality rates up to 60% in hospital for open surgery for type B aortic dissection. Now keep in mind that you're selecting out a group of complicated patients. They've either ruptured, they're in shock, malperfusing, whatever it be, but the acute surgery for it was terrible. TVAR has clearly taken over, uh, and TVAR has indicated for the treatment of type B aortic dissection, as Dr. Long talked about in, in her talk. How about uncomplicated? Uncomplicated, the traditional treatment has always been medical therapy. Why was the traditional treatment medical therapy? Because the surgery was brutal, right? And since the surgery was brutal and the outcomes for medical therapy were reasonable, obviously we chose optimal medical therapy. How about TVAR? Should we be doing TVAR in patients with uncomplicated aortic dissections? Well, let's try to answer this question. The current recommended guidelines for the treatment of type B aortic dissection, according to the European Surgery of Cardiology, or European Society of Cardiology, uncomplicated type B aortic dissection, medical therapy should always be recommended. For uncomplicated type B, should TVAR be considered? Their current recommendations are uh, 2A, which basically the weight of evidence favors it to be useful and efficacious, okay? Complicated type B, TVAR is recommended. Type one, uh, complicated type B surgery considered uh, lower recommendation, obviously because of the complications associated with surgery. So what are our objectives here? If we want to answer the question, should we be doing TVAR in patients with uncomplicated aortic dissections, we have to know what the natural outcome is, right? So let's see if we can figure out what the long-term outcome of medical therapy is. Our, uh, what are the complications associated with TVAR? So if we're going to do a TVAR, what are we gonna tell the patients who have uncomplicated type B dissections the complications related to the TVAR are? And number three, can we identify a subgroup of uncomplicated type B dissections that are going to benefit from TVAR? In other words, it's worth the risk for them to have a TVAR as opposed to optimal medical therapy. This is a study that was carried out in Sweden. And 
Social health care systems are great for following long-term studies because the patients come back, okay? There's no exchange of money between the doctor and the patient or the hospital and the patient, so they do a great job of following patients along, and Sweden is a classic social health care system. They followed 84 patients with uncomplicated type B aortic dissections treated medically for about 11 years. About uh, 66 patients were included in the study, mostly males, obviously. They had prospective long-term follow-up, but averaged about uh, anywhere from five, averaged about five to six years, but was up to 20 years, okay? And they defined events as freedom from dissection-related death and freedom from aortic event. They looked at patient survival, okay? They concluded that type B aortic dissection had a survival rate resembling the normal population. And what they did was they, they looked at a, a matched group of populations similar to what they had, and they found no difference in death rate between the two, okay? That pure intramural hematomas had an excellent prognosis. And this is an important point, intramural hematoma. We're talking about dissections. They had a heterogeneous group of patients, okay? So we've already said that a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a, there's a proportion of intramural hematomas that do very well. So they defined their dissection population, including intramural hematomas, which we do not necessarily do, okay? They did identify a, a subgroup who had an initial aortic diameter greater than four centimeters who were predictors of an aortic event in the long term. This is an important event, to, it's something important to remember, because this is gonna show up again and again. And they concluded that before TVAR could be recommended for uncomplicated type B dissections, the results of optimal medical therapy had to be matched or improved upon by doing TVARs, okay? So they concluded back in 2011 or so that, uh, I think, I, I take that back, this paper I believe was written in 2006, 2006, that, you know, unless we could prove patients were gonna do better with TVAR and had uncomplicated type B dissections, we shouldn't be doing it, okay? That's a long time ago in our business. So next, uh, the Mass General Group looked at a follow-up of about 12 years. Again, this is about 10 years later than the other group, okay? They had 298 patients with acute, uncomplicated type B aortic dissection treated medically, okay? And what they found was that um, they 50, uh, close to 60% of the patients had failed therapy. And that included deaths or aortic-related reinterventions. In other words, they developed the main thing that we see in these patients is degeneration of the aorta and aneurysm formation. So this is an entirely different group, obviously. They, they, they found that more than half of their patients requ required some treatment or died. What happened to my... I'm not, I don't seem to be changing channels here. Point it back there. It's like my control at home. <laughs> I think my wife plays with it just to frustrate me. Yeah. I think it might be out of oh, batteries. Is it working? Okay, so uh, what, they also, what they also looked at in their group was um, they, de they decided that ultimately those who required intervention had a significant Im improval in survival. The group that had intervention had a much greater, a sig statistically significant increased survival compared to the group that had medical management. So obviously they came to a different conclusion that we should be considering TVAR in these patients. This is a paper that was written by Ali Azizadeh, who many of you may or may not know. Uh, he's a vascular surgeon who's currently at Cedar sinai This was the Houston group. He was at Houston at the time. They had phenomenal numbers. Uh, they, they had a large cohort to study. And what they looked at was predictors of intervention and mortality in patients, again, with uncomplicated acute type, type B or dissection. They found that the survival, uh, there was a significant difference in survival between patients who had complicated and uncomplicated type B dissections, and, and that is certainly to be, be expected, okay? 
So we're selecting out a complicated group that's going to have a lesser survival. The uncomplicated group, however, you can see over a period of 10 years or so, they have about a 30% mortality. So that's pretty high mortality. So at five years, the uncomplicated group had 76.6% survival. <clears throat> they, looked, they then looked at certain parameters that were predictors of complication or survival, okay? And one of the things they found that the overall maximal diameter of the aorta, cutting it off at about 4.4 centimeters, there was a significant difference in survival between the group that were less than 4.4 centimeters and those that were greater than 4.4 centimeters. So there's that four centimeter number showing up again. Remember that showed up in the Swedish study also. Their intervention rates over a number of years, if you had a larger aorta, there was a higher likelihood you were gonna have significant intervention over the following years, okay? So again, here's that four number, 4.4, showing up with significant, uh, significant p-value. Intervention-free survival by false lumen size. They looked at false lumen size, 2.2 centimeters, 22 millimeters. Similar cutoff, there was a significant difference between survival and non-survival in patients who had a larger false lumen compared to a smaller false lumen. Overall survival, okay, they found uh, stratified for 60 years. Now, interestingly, they found that if you were greater than 60 years, you had a uh, lesser survival, and if you were less than 60 years, you had a greater survival, but there's actually a study that's gonna be the opposite here, <laughs> which kind of totally confused me, I must admit. So, and then what they did was they looked at number of risk factors. So if you had more than one risk factor, so let's say you had a false lumen that was greater than 2.2 and a total aortic diameter that was greater than 4.4, that your, your risk was significantly increased, okay? of having uh, of your survival rate was reduced. So they concluded that if your aortic diameter was greater than 4.4 millimeters, that was a predictor of mortality. If your age was greater than 60, that was a risk of mortality. And, and you had a decreased intervention survival, uh, free survival in those patients with false lumens greater than 2.2 or maximum aortic diameter greater than 4.4. Okay, so they considered that these, this group of patients should be considered for elective T-bar, okay? So are we selecting out a group of patients, therefore, that down the road, if get medical management initially, and then they get a T-bar? Um, this is another paper out of uh, actually Europe and uh, the US that looked similarly, and they listed, again, their, one of their predictors was age less than 60. So keep in mind the other one was age greater than 60, okay? But the, the things I'd like to point out here are number one, if you have a history of some genetic abnormality, that is gonna select you out. And I, I think we all agree upon that, that that's gonna select you out for being a predictor of, of uh, poor outcome, okay? The other thing, again, we're seeing um, aortic diameter is greater than four, okay? False lumen's greater than 2.2. So that's showing up again. Now, this is a interesting concept, the partially thrombosed false lumen. And it'll be one that I'll, I, I think we could talk about as a panel, but this is apparently somewhat controversial to partially, you would think that if your false lumen is thrombosing, that would be a good thing. But actually it appears that that may be a negative indicator for, for you and a predictor of poor outcome, okay? So this is the only randomized trial that looked at taking patients with uncomplicated dissections and randomizing them to TVAR or medical therapy. And at five years, they found that TVAR was associated with improved aortic specific survival and delayed disease progression, specifically aneurysm formation. So why not do TVARs on everybody, okay? So, I mean, if, we, if, if, it's a, if the procedure had no risk, then we, could, we would just say, okay, we're gonna do it on everybody. So what are the risks? Uh, one risk that we want to totally avoid is this risk of type A aortic dissection. And uh, uh, the risk quoted uh, rate of this is um, about two to 3%. For treatment of type B aortic dissection with TVAR, the incidence of type 
a retrograde aortic dissection is about two to three percent. There are certain risk factors. We try to avoid doing a TVAR in patient in, in the acute stage. Remember, Dr. Long mentioned the acute, subacute, and chronic stage. So that acute stage is less than 14 days. So if we can get the patient through the first 14 days, we can reduce the risk of type A dissection. Size mismatch is an issue. Uh, don't oversize the stent compared to the native aorta by greater than 10% or so. This is important because when we treat patients with aneurysms, we want a longer seal zone and we want that, we want that stent to be you know, well fixed into the aorta itself. But when you're dealing with a dissection, we don't have to have that oversizing required. And if we oversize too much, we're gonna increase the risk of dissection. Uh, spring back force is something that we experienced within the last 10, two weeks. Spring back force is basically uh, when you place the stent in the aortic arch, the stent wants to stay straight, okay? So stent wants to stay straight, the arch wants to be curved. So the, uh, anti, so the uh, front spring or the uncovered segment of the, of the stent, the so-called bare metal stent, will spring back and push on the aorta constantly, okay? And this increases the risk of potential type B, uh, aortic dissection. So avoiding putting seg the, the, uh, the stent into particularly tortuous segments where the bare metal spring is going to be forcing up against the aorta uh, is a significant risk factor. Location of the landing zone, we'll talk about landing zones in a couple of minutes, and uh, avoid it in, in uh, syndromic genetic disorders. Dr. Byers would love that again, he likes that. <laughs> but uh, avoiding endovascular treatments in syndromic genetic disorders is generally recommended, okay? The incidence, again, is like 1.5 to 3%. It has a very high mortality, uh, and um, uh, the occurrence is highest immediately postoperatively, and there are those who propose that we should always get a CTA on these patients that have type B aortic dissections who get a TVAR before they're discharged from the hospital because up to 10 to 15% of them will be asymptomatic. The risk declines significantly after the first six months. So measures to reduce type A aortic dissection, delay end and grafting for a minimum of 14 days, ideally 30 to 60 days. Avoid oversizing greater than 10%. Uh, the proximal landing zone should be in healthy aorta. Avoid zone zero to two, we'll talk about zones in a moment. Avoid tortuosity as we talked about and consider open surgery or a hybrid procedure for patients who have syndromic disorders. This is a patient of Dr. Youssef's and mine, and this is his CT scan from about 10 days ago. He had a type B aortic dissection that we uh, treated at about, actually he, so he was discharged from hospital with a type B for maximum medical therapy came back in the hospital within well, probably about two weeks or so, right in that subacute range with an extension of the, his dissection and increasing pain. So we did, a, we did a type B TVAR on him. He then represented to the hospital at about six months, almost exactly, with a history of chest pain, was admitted to the hospital um, the evening before, this institution, Cherry Hill, um, I got a call the next morning about him that he was in the hospital and uh, they were considering doing a cath on him. And I said, well, uh, let's get a CAT scan on him and you can see he has a retrograde type A aortic dissection. Uh, Dr. Youssef brought him down and operated on him as an emergency. I believe he's gonna go home today, wasn't he? Yeah. So he initially presented with chest pain. So there's, I mean, it, it happens. And, and in him, I, I think you can comment maybe later, uh, Sam, I think it was that spring back phenomenon, wasn't it? Really, pretty much. Uh, the other complication that's associated with type B dissections is neurologic complications. And, and uh, these, these are the potentially catastrophic complications associated with TVAR for, uh, and, and they, they are stroke and spinal cord ischemia. Um, patients always look, I give you kind of that puppy dog look, you know, the pup, when the dog kind of goes like this, when you're talking about, well, we could injure your spinal cord, they go, huh? You know because they, they don't really understand the whole concept, oh, the spinal cord blood supply is coming from the thoracic aorta that we're gonna interrupt. Um, 
So stroke itself, um, the incidence is in an order of about 3%. Um, the major risk factors uh, in a large study were obesity, amount of blood loss during the procedure, vascular complications, those most typically being uh, limb ischemia or evidence of embolization, and aortic arch atherosclerosis. And so, the, um, so basically patients with bad vascular disease in general are the ones that are gonna be at increased risk of stroke. There was actually no association with landing zone, and these are landing zones too. So landing zone four is, is uh, basically the descending thoracic aorta. Three is abutting upon the subclavian but not involving it. Two is involving the subclavian. One, the left carotid, and then zone zero is the anomalous. So you may say, well, why would you land a T-var in zone zero? Well, those patients have clearly undergone some sort of arch reconstruction or something of that nature. But, but there was, interestingly, no major association between those landing zones and the subsequent development of stroke. And, and one of the reasons, I think, for that is that we are, we're manipulating guide wires and catheters through this whole arch area when we're doing a T-var, and that potentially is why they're, they're gonna have strokes related to whatever is landing zone. Let's talk about the spinal cord. Again, the patients are often confused and curious about spinal cords and why we would be concerned. The arterial anatomy of the spinal cord has a single longitudinal artery going anteriorly. There is sort of a plexiform of posterior lateral spinal arteries. The, they all originate from the vertebral arteries. And uh, there is segmental blood flow to the spinal cord from the intercostals. <clears throat> Why do patients get spinal cord injury? Well, one of two things. Ischemia, either, either distal aortic perfusion pressures are too low. There may be interruption of the segmental arteries of which the artery of Adamkowitz is this mysterious artery that everyone talks about. And whether it truly does exist or not is really sort of this mysterious cardiac and vascular phenomenon. Uh, and then uh, uh, the other thing that's been associated with it is perioperative hypotension. So when we're doing a TVAR, we always are raising their mean pressures. We want their mean pressures high to increase their perfusion. There also is the issue of whether there could actually be some reperfusion injury to the cord itself. Risk factors, emergency surgery, prolonged cross-clamp time for open surgery, pro, uh, perioperative hypotension, avoid this center whenever possible, the amount of aorta excluded. So if we exclude greater than 200, 200 millimeters or 20 centimeters of aorta, the, the paraplegia rate goes up significantly. Prior AAA repair, which interrupts collateral flows through the lumbar vessels uh, and also uh, vessels of the hypogastric arteries and patients with advanced age. Interruption of spinal cord collaterals, the left subclavian. Again, if we're going to cover a large portion of the thoracic aorta, we will do a carotid subclavian bypass because that vertebral artery is gonna supply a source of blood flow to the spine. Interruption of the hypogastric arteries, patients with advanced atherosclerosis and diabetics are also at increased risk. The goal in spinal cord protection is to improve spinal cord perfusion pressure, and this is why when, we, again, they give you that puppy dog look when you tell them we're gonna put a lumbar drain in. They, they don't understand that the spinal cord perfusion pressure is the mean arterial pressure minus the CSF pressure. So we wanna drive the mean arterial pressure up, drive the CSF pressure down to increase the spinal perfusion pressure. Um, the mean CSF pressure we maintain is about 15 millimeters of mercury in that range. We limit drainage to about 10 to 15 mLs per hour of cerebrospinal fluid. If they do show signs of spinal cord injury, they have now have what we call the COPS protocol. If there's malfunction of the drain, we replace it. If, the, if, there, if it's normal, we lay the patient flat, we'll drain them down to five, centimeter, five millimeters of mercury and drain them for a prolonged period of time, seven days. We currently drain them for about 48 hours and then we assess them to follow that if they're uncomplicated. Increase oxygen delivery, increase cardiac output, hemoglobin, make sure their O2 sets up, and then uh, again, increase perfusion pressure, mean arterial pressure up, spinal cord perfusion pressure down, uh, and uh, or CSF pressure down, increase spinal cord perfusion pressure, okay? Complications associated with lumbar drains, um, neuroaxial hematomas in the spine itself, intracranial hemorrhage, this patient's had a little hemorrhage here, 
CSF leaks, spinal headaches, meningitis, or fractured catheters. So, do patients with uncomplicated type B aortic dissection benefit from TVAR? What are the predictors of late adverse events? Again, as we said, if their mid, if their mid aortic diameter is greater than 40 millimeters, if they have a false lumen greater than two, 22 millimeters, partial thrombosis of the false lumen, I actually think it makes sense to me younger patients, makes more sense to me, and hereditary connective tissue disorders are all predictors of poor outcome. Here's a patient who had a subacute type B aortic dissection that was referred to me actually for a second opinion. And he actually had um, a thoracic, mid aortic thoracic diameter of 40, about 45 millimeters. Uh, he's from uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, he's from one of the small hospitals near here. He had seen a vascular surgeon there presented with a type A dissection. He was in his 50s. Uh, he was hypertensive. And uh, you can see that he also has significant malperfusion. There's his true lumen. That's his false lumen. The true lumen is a little slit there. So in him, we actually did do a, uh, a T-bar. And uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, Sam, you and I did this case together. We, we actually, we, we ballooned the descending thoracic aorta not the ascending aorta, in order to uh, uh, expand the uh, uh, graft and obliterate the false lumen. IVUS, uh, you've heard a little bit about IVUS, and uh, uh, IVUS is an adjunct uh, to CTA, angiography, and uh, TEE. Uh, it, it assures us that we have the wire in the true lumen. If you've got the wire in the false lumen and you open the stent, other than rare cases where they do it intentionally, you're going to kill the patient. Um, uh, assess the adequacy of your treatment. Uh, guide any additional therapy or, or diagnose any complications. So here's a patient with, uh, as Dr. Long pointed out earlier, with significant malperfusion. And here's the actual IVUS after we had placed the stent. Uh, you can see that the true lumen is significantly larger than this little tiny collapse thing. Again, here's a similarly a patient with true, total true, true lumen compression. This is the true lumen here. This is the false lumen. And here's a, also some films here before and after. Here's the celiac, uh, significantly compressed, improved, SMA, and uh, one of the renals significant improvement following um, re, uh, placement of the stent. And what we're doing here when we do this is we're, we're trying to um, initiate aortic remodeling. The concept of aortic remodeling is closure of the false lumen, avoidance of complications, improving perfusion to those vessels that are compromised. And this uh, just shows from one study looked at true lumen and false lumen diameters in terms of aortic remodeling and what happened after, and you can see there's significant reduction in the false lumen diameter and increase in size of true lumen diameter and area following placement of the endografts. So what do we conclude? Well, if you've got a type B aortic dissection and it's complicated, hopefully you don't need to have it in your open surgery. It has a very high mortality rate, up to 60%. TVAR is the selected management. In type B aortic dissections, there are a group, a subgroup of patients who would benefit from uh, delayed TVAR. The majority of the patients with uncomplicated type B aortic dissection can be managed safely by optimal medical therapy. There is an identifiable small subgroup of patients who should be considered for TVAR, and when you carry out TVAR in high-risk centers, you can carry it out with low risks and complications. Okay? So, I'm right on, too.